we're going to be covering a subject that most preachers kind of like, they don't know a whole lot about it. I'm saying, uh, because listen, and the only reason I'm saying that is because I've been in church for a long time. I gave my heart to the Lord when I was, when I was really young. And I really didn't hear much teaching on any of this until probably about eight, nine years ago, whenever the Lord started opening up my eyes to see some things. And, you know, the word, the word of God, it's, it's in the word. And so I want to, I want to make this. Thank you. Yeah. So I want to, I want to make the point that, um, that we, in this church, we believe the word of God is the word of God. We believe the Bible is actually God's word. Now, the, the way it's described in Whenever Paul wrote the letter to Timothy, he said this. He said, all scripture is inspired. And that word inspired in the Greek is theo, which means God, noustos. Where we get the word pneumonia or pneumatic, we're talking about air, wind. Theo, noustos, it's God breathed. So God breathed into man and used man as a vessel to write his word upon paper. Why would he do such a thing? Because man communicates in human language. And so... We believe the word of God is the word of God. Amen. And that's why we study it the way we do. That's why I study it the way I do. And that's why some of you have stayed around long enough to continue to study with us as we study because you believe the same way. Now, I will tell you that. Can you put this one scripture up there before we get started? Uh, I believe it's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. So the subject that we're going to get into tonight is a little bit different. And so I just wanted to give you the scripture. See what it says right there? It says, but the natural mind receives not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because why they are spiritually discerned in order to understand spiritual things. A man cannot operate with a carnal mind or a natural mind. He must operate with a spiritual mind. Well, how does that process even begin? The word of God teaches us that the first time we're born, we're born like Adam because, and we're born into sin. Listen, I don't have time to go backwards that far because I really do want to move forward. But I do want to say this. It's important that we understand the word of God teaches. I believe that. I believe that we all came from Adam. Amen. Anything that tells a different story, I believe there's hidden truth. I understand that a lot of times science doesn't agree with theology. But what I'm trying to say is, is that theology and the true biblical text is really telling us the truth of how this world started. I understand they got things out there like carbon-14 and all this other scientific data. And they're trying to prove it. No, no, no. The word of the Lord is going to stand forever. That's what I believe. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. I've seen the change in my life. I've seen what, where God brought me from and where he's brought me to. And I've seen as I have chosen to believe God at his word and to trust him. And even though people around me might ridicule me and even though they might not understand me, I know what God has done for yes. me. Yes. So a man must be, be born again. That's what I'm getting at. In order to go from a natural mind to a spiritual mind, first of all, a man must be born again. Well, what are you trying to say? The book of Romans says that you must believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he rose from the dead. What does that mean? He paid the penalty for sin and he had no sin. You see, he was the sinless sacrifice that paid the wage of sin. Amen. And when you get saved, when you get born again, I didn't teach that. I didn't write it. Jesus wrote it. John chapter three. When you get born again, a spiritual miracle takes place in your heart. Happened to me when I was 19. A little bit of your church in Burbank, Louisiana. Had hair down my back and you know the story. I was like, oh Lord, I was a mess, guys. I was on all kinds of stuff, all messed up, high school dropout. But guess what? That woman was willing to preach the blood of Jesus. Yes, that sir. woman yes, was willing sir. to tell the truth. And when she did, the Holy Spirit dealt with my heart and I ran up to that altar. My life has never been the same. Far from perfect, but never been the same. The natural mind cannot receive the things of the Lord because they're spiritually understood. That's the first step. And having a spiritual mind is becoming born again. Amen. So I just want to encourage you that as we move forward in tonight's uh, content, if, you, if, if, if it seems almost like so outrageous that you can't believe it, then first of all, you got to have a nap, you got to have a spiritual mind. Amen. But secondly, even though you have a spiritual mind, I'm sorry, even though you're born again, sometimes... There's still a lot of people out there that love the Lord and some things that come across is difficult for them to swallow. All right. So what are we talking about tonight? Let's move forward and let's 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 just go ahead. We're talking about something called the Nephilim. All right. Now, I have a, a, I have a purpose in doing this. Number one is the word of the Lord. But number two, I want you to also understand something. I want you to 
whenever I'm done with this end times teaching, so we're about to, we're just starting tonight an end times series. This thing might last four months, five months. I have no idea how long this thing's going to last. I'm going to be honest with you. I just covering the content of, ne of the Nephilim and I already got three messages just on that. Lord help us. So, but, but in the end, what I want you to understand is I don't want to just talk about Daniel. I don't want to just talk about the book of Revelation. I want, when it's all said and done, I want you as the people that come to this church or anybody that watches on video, I want you to be prepared in your heart and your mind to have some kind of an understanding of what we're actually dealing with here. What are you talking about? I'm talking about deception. I'm talking about if there's a real God, then there's a real devil. I'm, I'm talking about the fact that this devil is playing for keeps. I, I don't care if anybody thinks. I'm not talking about some something. I don't know. He might be have red horns and he might have a, you know, I wouldn't doubt if he had slew foot like a goat. I wouldn't doubt if he didn't look just like a goat for all I know. But whether he looks, what he looks like, I'm here to tell you what he's doing. He's here to cause deception upon the earth and he's here to thwart to the plan of God and to cause people to be moved away from God. Yeah. And he's got his claws, if I could say it that way, entrenched in all levels of society. And he is bringing a message, and listen to me, there is an anointing to his message. It's a demonic anointing. It's not a Holy Ghost anointing. Right. And, and you may not agree with this, and this might poke you in the eye, but I'm here to tell you, whenever you've got musicians on a stage and what they're singing is to entice people's flesh, right. what are you talking about? Well, back when I was 19, 19, before I went to that altar in that church in Burwick, I was all about, I'm going to just be real, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, baby. Let's do this. All right, and let's not just do it a little bit. Let's do it wide open and let's see who can hang and who can keep up. All right. And 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 so what I'm trying to say is, is that that's how many people are living their life. And that's how many musicians are creating music and they're enticing people to live that way. I mean, I just used that one example of a song that I remember back from the 80s by Motley Crue when he said, we're going to take a swig of whiskey and jump into the side with you. I'm a lyric guy. He meant something when he said that. He wasn't talking to, it wasn't, he wasn't a cowboy. No, he was talking, he was talking about fornication. He was talking about getting drunk. He was talking about living a party lifestyle and everything that would move you away from the things and the ways of God. That's just one little snippet. There's the whole thing is like that. Does that make sense? So what I'm trying to say is there's messengers on a stage and they have an anointing, but it's not a Holy Ghost anointing. And they're driving humanity in a particular direction. Go ahead and put Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. We haven't even, I don't want to get back to the Nephilim, but I'm just trying to make a point. <laughs> I'm trying to make a point of why I'm even bringing this up because I want you in the end to be able to see the deception. So then what it says here, where in time passed, you walked according to the course of this world. See, before you got saved, you and I, before you got saved, before I got saved, trust me, you, you're never going to hear me trying to act like I was all perfect because Lord knows I was a mess. But before we got saved, if we're saved tonight, we walked the course of this world. We were following along the path just like everybody else. The crowd is going one way, the straight and narrow. And few will be found on the straight and narrow. Many will be found where the gate is wide and the path is wide, right? And it's going to lead to destruction. He said, but in times past, you walked according to the course of this world. Look at this. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works now in the children of disobedience. So I want you to understand and I want you to know something that the word of God teaches that there is an enemy of your soul. There's an enemy that's trying to destroy humanity. And he's, he's noted here as the spirit of the power of the air. And he's working in the atmosphere, if we can say it like that, in the spiritual realm. You know, we're going to, when, when in about three weeks probably, we're going to get into Ephesians where it talks about that we don't war against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Listen to me. The fight that you fight is not in the flesh. You can't, you can't say, come on, lust. I'm about to pop you in the eye and I'm going to win. No, 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 no. You can't fight lust like that. Come on. Come on, you drug addiction. I'm about to pop you in the eye. No, no, no. You can't fight it in the flesh. You can't wrangle with these things in the flesh. These are spiritual strongholds. Don't you wish it would be that easy? I mean, you win sometimes, you lose sometimes. If I could just, if I could just get them down and, and get them in a chokehold or something, I could win. But that doesn't work that way. And, and we got to learn how to allow, we got, first off, we got to even be able to see what we're in the midst of. See, the enemy's plan for your life is to destroy you, to torment your mind, to, to grab a hold of your heart and 
to destroy you. Yes. Listen to me. Jesus preached on hell, my friend. Oh, modern day preachers don't want to preach on that because they could make the seats stay empty. But, but Jesus preached on hell. He, he said that there was a place where the worm dies not, where the fire is not quenched, and there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, people try to say, oh, yeah. He was talking about the Valley of Hinnom. That was a physical place. It's not a real hell. No, Jesus used the Valley of Hinnom to describe Gehenna, which is the last death, which is an eternal burning hell where people that refuse Jesus are going to end up. And people tell me, how are you going to love a God that sends people to hell? I know I've told you all that before, but I said, no, 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 time out. God's not sending nobody to hell, my friend. Right. God sent a lamb. I say, God sent a lamb. Hallelujah. A sinless lamb. His only begotten son. That, and whoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent a way. But the problem is, is that mankind didn't like the way that God sent. And they wanted to go their own way. So, no, let's not blame it on the Lord. God, he sent a lamb. And he showed us in his word what his plan was. And he's asking us. He's inviting us. Amen. We'll get into all that too. He's inviting us to the banquet. Amen. All right. So Nephilim. What does it mean? Let's get into that. It means fallen ones. In the Hebrew, that's, that's one of the meanings. Fallen ones. <laughs> now, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of like break. I want to break the, the, the news to you right up front. The whole story here surrounds the concept that... The sons of God, which is, we're going to get into the scripture, uh, co, co mingled with the daughters of men. So within the text of the scriptures, we're trying to find out who are the sons of God. And the end result, I'm going to go ahead and give you the zinger up front because sometimes I hold back on until the end. But this is one of the ones I just want to give it to you up front. The sons of God, and we're going to get into it, are, the, are angels. Fallen angels. Fallen angels that crossed boundaries that God did not allow them. They were already fallen. That's not how they fell. They fell when they threw their lot in with the liar, which is was known by the occult world as Lucifer, the light bearer. But he's known in the word of God as Satan, the deceiver, the slanderer. And so how did this happen? I have no idea how this happened. But I'm going to give you some scripture that show that angels can present themselves in human forms. I got two scriptures. I wrote this thing last week. This has already been in here. And I'm going to show you two different episodes. One was in the city of Sodom. That angel showed up over there to find Lot. And the other one, the, the other one had to do with the Apostle Paul warning people in the book of Hebrews. That, that they could entertain strangers unaware. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is this. I'm about to get into it. But... And I listen, I've read tons of extra biblical material. And I want to try to stick to the scripture. I'm a scripture guy. Okay, but I want to tell you a little bit of some of the things that I've learned, all right? I guess I would describe this as, it seems as though angels, if you would permit me to do this, can transmorph or transmutate, whatever you want to call that word. Meaning that they can take upon, there, if I could say it, I put it, hey, listen, I put it in my book. I, I'm all, I want to give out this book. I've got about 10 copies left. If, you, if I know most of y'all have already read it. Some of you are reading it now. The only purpose in wanting you to read this book, I was a novice writer. I'm going to be honest with you. It's just the first book I ever wrote. I had to self-publish it myself. I felt like, well, but it explains a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about. That five-hour video I put on our church Facebook page, I put that for a reason. It explains what's going on in the world. Sometimes it's better if you can see it put in this kind of a format or you can see it and you look at pictures. You start, you know, sometimes whenever you see pictures, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. And when you see a thousand pictures that keep showing you the same thing, at some point in time, it's like, oh my goodness, what's going on? And so you begin to see physical evidence that there's something going on out there that looks occultic, that looks like it's a big old mess of a plan. And then all of a sudden, the only, the only conclusion that I can come to is why are they going through all this? Why are they doing all this? Because God is real. Because Jesus is real. And the plan is to move humanity away from that truth. That's the simple <coughs> conclusion that I have come to. So these Nephilim are part of that plan. These Nephilim, these, which are a hybrid race. Okay, we're going to get into the scriptures. Like I said, there's Nephilim that are a hybrid race that come from, that come from the coming together of fallen angels and the daughters of men produce this hybrid race upon the earth. Now, one of the things that I didn't know for the longest time as I was trying to find out in the word of God where demon spirits came from, I couldn't figure it out. A lot of people have a lot of different theories. Some people say a pre-Adamite race. 
I don't believe that. I believe that demon spirits come from dead nothing. Listen, we're going to get into it probably next time we teach about this. But there was nests of Nephilim all up and down in Canaan. The word of God says they were in the Philistines. Goliath was one of them things. They were up around Mount Hermon. They were all up above the Sea of Galilee. They were, they were located in all kinds of areas. And, and listen, they went, they went to war with Israel at various times and God gave them victories. Amen. So whenever, whenever those Nephilim died, their spirit was released. So that's the, that's the big zinger I'm trying to let you know. These are demon spirits. Demon spirits and fallen angels that want to work and use human beings as vessels. See, the difference between a demon, and, and, and I think we have some scripture to talk about a little bit of this tonight. The, the, difference between, the big difference between a demon and an angel is what I'm trying to explain to y'all is that an angel has some type of a celestial body. Okay, I'm really not trying to get too deep here, but, but spiritually speaking, you and I are three-dimensional beings. I don't, I listen, I don't understand physics well enough to try to teach you this, but I'm going to tell you what I believe. You are a three-dimensional being. I can see you have depth to you, right? But there's a fourth dimension. I believe that, they, listen, the Bible says that when Jesus resurrected from the dead, he walked through walls. He walked through walls. He told Thomas, go ahead, stick your finger right here. See that I am not flesh and, flesh and bone. He didn't say nothing about blood. Stick your finger in here and see that I am flesh and bone. He says the spirit doesn't have, it's not like that. So he was in a glorified body, but that glorified body was not restricted by the material objects that are in here. I got to say it like this. Even though I'm not smart enough to say it, I got to say it. When in junior high school in chemistry, and even as a nurse at Nichols, I didn't do that great in the class. I think I made a B. But they, in organic chemistry, they taught me that, that on the elemental chart, that each of these elements were made up of a certain amount of atoms or electrons and neutrons. And what they told me was is that these, these atom particles are in motion. You remember that? Yeah. You remember that? So what does that mean? What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm trying to say to you that this right here is in motion according to what, what scientists say. This chair that I can sit down into. This pulpit that sits right here. I don't understand it, but they're telling me that these things are in motion. These things are made up of atoms. It's made of matter. And these things are in motion. The word of God says that if God quits speaking, things start falling apart. I'm just letting you know. So, however that works, and again, I don't understand it completely, but in that glorified body, Jesus, no, no, no material atoms held him. He walked through it. He could be translated to another area. Okay? That was in his glorified body. He still ate fish. He spoke with them. They could see him. They, they, they knew that he was there. So I'm, what I'm really just trying to describe to you right now is a spiritual realm that you and I can't see. But somehow these angels can transmute or transmorph themselves into some type of a physical, visible situation to where you can see them to the point where Paul warns, and we'll get into the scripture in a second, that sometimes people, not without even knowing, have entertained angels Unaware. So I want you to understand. Now, again, I'm not even saying that's how it happened. So you're trying to say an angel became a man, slept with a woman, and then this thing. That's not what I'm trying to say exactly because I don't understand it completely. I'm just saying that's one possibility. Is it some kind of a bioengineering kind of thing? Okay, let's just stop for a second. Whoa, dude, slow down, tap the brakes. You're going way too fast. No, we got I don't know how you think, but that's how my brain thinks. So, so now in the, in the next step of it, and I, I'm just trying to get some of this stuff out in the open. Have you, have you bothered watching the news lately? Or do you quit watching the news? Because I quit watching the news. Right. But somebody told me the other day, dude, they talking about aliens on Fox News. Now, let me just ask you a question. Let me just ask you a quick question. Do you believe Fox News still? No. I mean, because, look, I fired them. Okay, for whatever my reason, I fired them. I don't believe nothing that the media says. Right. I'm just telling you straight up. But I will tell you this. I do believe that the media feeds us what they're allowed to feed us. That's what I believe. I do believe that the media feeds us the things that they want us to know. Listen, I've talked to people that, that were in other countries that said, dude, we're getting a whole different news over here than what y'all get over there. Things about your own country. He said, when we watch it on, when we watch our news on the television, we're getting a whole different twist of things than what y'all get. Right. Now, that's just one level of it. All right, and so what I'm trying to tell you is just the other day, I'm like, man, what is this stuff about talking about aliens? So I click on there, and you can look it up later after church. If you want, you can Google it right now. I don't care. Look at Fox. Fox and Friends talked about aliens. And whatever that guy, Ducey, Peter Ducey, or whatever his name is, there he is. And you know this guy? He's got an ex-CIA guy 
who that was his job to look into all this. And he's like, oh, no, yeah. And basically tell them the whole story and they act like they're going to show up in June. Now, whether or not that happens or not is a whole other story. I'm trying to make a point to you. If, any, if aliens show up at your house, and the, what the Lord has already showed me seven years ago when I wrote this book was that aliens are nothing but fallen angels in disguise. They ain't coming from another planet, my friend. They're coming from another dimension. So I don't even know that they're going to show up. But if they ever do show up, I'm here to tell you right now, don't buy the lie. And is it possible, these are just thoughts for you to think. I know you people are going to think I'm crazy, but they already think I'm crazy anyway. These are just thoughts for you to think on what are these alien abductions all about? What is this, all this body fluid still and stuff that they talk about? I've never been an alien person, man. I'm just telling you, when I dig into the depths of the wickedness of Aleister Crowley, huh, come on. You don't know much about Aleister Crowley, probably, hopefully not, but I studied him. And you know what I found out about Aleister Crowley? He says that he got intelligence from an angel, and he drew a picture of the angel. You know, it looked like a gray alien. All this stuff going on in 1947 with the whole Roswell incident. I, mean, I, I done spent so much time on all this. I'm trying to make a point to you, though. I'm just trying to prepare. I don't know how this went down. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. The Bible says that fallen angels co with the daughters of men. And that there were giants in the land. And they, they began to wreak havoc over Israel. And Israel had to fight against these things. And I'm here to tell you that I believe with all of my heart that when they died. Because look, young David killed one. And he, you know what he told the lies? He said, you come at me with spirit and sword, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. Amen. And he Amen. sunk that rock in that giant's head. Yeah. And then he took his own sword and he cut his head off. Amen. And so the Lord gave victory over those giants in the land. But I'm here to tell you that when they're released, we're going to get it. You know what? This is an intro right here. I'm just going to keep on moving with this. <laughs> Listen, when they're released, the Bible teaches that they go into the abyss. How do you know that? Because Jesus went to cast out devils out of out of the out of legion. And what did they say? Oh, don't send us. You showed up before the appointed time. Don't send us back to the abyss. Let us go into pigs. You remember that? Yeah. Okay, and I'm also going to bring you probably next week or the week after to Saul whenever the anointing left him and he had already previously told all the witches to get out of the land. And then now the Lord's not answering him. What does he do? He goes to a witch, which is weird enough because you know where she was from? Anybody remember? Indoor. Indoor. The witch from Indoor. Did anybody watch uh, Bewitched when they were young? Yeah. What was Samantha's mama's name? Indora. Indora. Oh, I know. It gets weirder the more you go. Uh, but, but anyway, nevertheless, I'm just trying to make a point. The witch of Endor, thousands of years before Jesus ever showed up on the face of the earth, about 1000 BC, Saul goes to her. He says, I need you to pull Samuel up for me. A familiar spirit is what they call that. And all of a sudden, she, he says, what do you see? I see God's coming up out of the abyss. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that there's a whole other world out there that you and I have been relatively naive to. And, and they, but they know a lot about the Bible, but we haven't known a lot about what's going on with them. And they're all about deception and blinding people's eyes. And that same spirit is all about coming in to the house of God to, to try to deceive the elect of God, to try to pull us away from the things of God. And that's really what I'm, my whole point is in all of this before it's all said and done. But we're going to go back to the root. So let's look at Jude chapter 1 verses 6 through 7. And let's take a look. At some of these scriptures right here, and we're gonna we're gonna kind of just do a survey, and then we're gonna dig a little bit deeper, amen. Because that's just how I like to do it. So look at Jude one. Jude is the second last. You can go ahead and pull it up there. Jude chapter one, verses six through seven. We're gonna look at it together. And um, so, listen. Maybe you didn't know, but Jude is one of the, one of the Lord's half brothers, amen. And uh, he. You know, the story goes that Jesus' own brothers didn't believe in him whenever he was walking the earth. James was one of his brothers. Jude was one of his brothers. But after he died and he rose from the dead, they, they believed in him and they were pillars in the church. But this is Jude. And he says, and the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the day judgment of the great day. Now, we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into this, but I just want you to see what this is saying right here. It's saying on this first level, Jude, which is the second to last book of the book of, of, of the New Testament, 
that the, that there were some angels. Actually, actually, let's go to verse seven because we're going to look a little bit deeper into <laughs> into what this uh, this scripture is talking about. It says right here, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now go back to the previous verse. I want you to see something. These angels kept not their first estate, their own habitation. They left a place where they were supposed to be and they crossed boundaries that they weren't allowed to. And we're going to dig it out in the words here in a moment. But because of the decision that they made to do this, they, they're now in everlasting chains of darkness. They're waiting the day of judgment when they're going to be released according to the book of Revelation. There's coming a day whenever there's going to be a key given to an angel and he's going to open up the abyss, the, the bottomless pit, and it's going to allow all kinds of demonic spirits to come out. Some of those spirits are out here right now, and the way that I believe that they're out is because it's through the process of conjuring. i got biblical evidence to tell you, and you either believe the Bible or you don't, but according to the Bible, that witch of Endor was used to pulling these things up, and people have been pulling them up, and that's where these demon, demonic spirits are. Uh, as far as the ones in the earth, but there's a whole lot more of them down there that ain't come up yet. But according to the book of Revelation, when God's wrath hits, amen, in the end, they're going to be released. Now, what I want you to see here is, is, that, the, is that the way, the, what, what they did specifically, and, and I'm going to break it down for you here in a minute, but look at verse 7 again. Look what they did. It says, even as. So that's an adverbial type clause. What does that mean? An adverb modifies a verb, Right? We learned that. Adverbs modify verbs. So that means it's not talking about the cities around there. It's talking about what was done. Those angels sinned in a similar fashion or in an almost like an exact way as what the people of Sodom were doing. Now, what, what, is, what is it saying that they did? The angels left where they were supposed to be and they committed fornication going after strange flesh just as the citizens of Sodom did, and that was describing the concept of homosexuality. That they, that they were committing fornication and that they were going, because according to the word of God, it, you know, a man and a woman, and then also in the book of Romans, where it talks about in Romans chapter one, where it says that a man would leave the use of a woman and you would go after a man, and that a woman would leave the natural use of a woman and go after a woman. That that was the end result of whenever people's hearts were hardened in rejecting the gospel, okay? But listen, what I want you to see is this is even as, so that is what went down, and, and this is the first piece of evidence that I'm trying to show you from the Bible, that angels crossed the boundaries and went after something that they were not supposed to go after. And the end result of that is that they ended up in chains waiting for the day of judgment. Now, again, I've already said it. How did this happen? And I, I made the comment. Is this a transmorphing or a transmutation, a shape-shifting kind of thing, the way I worded it in my book, versus some type of a bioengineering? I don't have the answer for that. I'm just telling you what the Bible says, right? Okay, let's look at Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 2. And this talks about that scripture I was telling you. Look what it says. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Now, I got to tell you that some people would say, okay, but that's good angels. That's a good angel that, that can transmorph or transmute or shape shift or whatever we're going to call it to, to show up in some type of a physical body that we can't tell the difference. Most people would never dream in a million years that a fallen angel could do that, but why not? Why do we believe that? Yep. There's nothing that tells us in the word of God contrary to that. And you know, one thing that I want you to know is, is that that makes a big difference. There's only two men that, will, that we know of that were ever possessed by a fallen angel. That was Judas Iscariot. He was possessed by Satan himself. And the Antichrist will also be possessed by Satan himself. We do, what we do know is that typically it's demon spirits that are looking to possess and use human beings as vessels. Why? Because they previously were in a vessel, and this is what I believe, previously in a vessel in the Nephilim, the giants in the land, before they died and then they're released. And so they're seeking a habitation and they're looking for a vessel to live within. All right? Does that make sense what I'm saying? All right, Genesis 19, 
1 through 2. This is what this is the scripture what I was telling you about with Lot. It says that there came two angels to Sodom at the evening, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. Now, there's a whole lot more to that story. I'm not going to get into it tonight. But nevertheless, what I want you to see is that these angels showed up to the city of Sodom to meet up with Lot and Lot was able to see them and he invited them into his home. All right. So let's go just a little bit deeper and let's go back to Jude chapter one, verses six through seven. And I want to show you a word in the, I'm going to, if I had my iPad working like I want to, to where I could put all this stuff on the screen, which we're about to get Bluetooth coming up soon, I'd be able to show you the words it, on the screen, you know, in my Bible app, but I can't do that right now. So I want you to go back to Jude 1, 6 through 7, and where it says right there, first estate, I want you to see first estate and habitation. All right, so the first estate and the habitation describe two different things, but they describe where these, these angels were before. So the word, the word first estate describes really a, a position or a position of authority, if that makes sense. A position of authority, I'm just going to abbreviate all right, so they had a position of authority in reference to angels or a higher being in the, in the celestial sense than what human beings are. They're far superior in intelligence to what we are. They're far superior in power to what we are, according to the things that we see taught about angels in the Bible. All right, but they left this position that they were given. God never told them that they could. They left this position. And this word right here in the Greek is literally, it could be, it could mean house, all right? The word in the Greek is oikaterion. It's not really that important that we know that, but I just want you to know that that word in the Greek means house. Now, I want you to go to 2 Corinthians 5, 2. I'm going to show you, I'm trying to make a point. These angels left their habitation. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm bringing you through the scriptures to show you in the end, I um, hope that you're on the same page with me, but because I believe that the Bible is the word of God, can you prove what you're trying to say from the Bible? That's what I'm trying to do. All right. For in this we grow. Now, what is he talking about? This is the Apostle Paul. He's preaching. He's writing a letter to the Corinthian church. And he's saying, in this we groan. In what? In this human body is what he's talking about. Right. He's saying, in this we groan. And we, we, we desire to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. So what he's saying is while we're on this earth and we're doing the ministry of God and we're going through trials and tribulations and we're going through persecutions, sometimes it hurts, my friend. Sometimes it's painful. And sometimes we just want to go ahead. Lord, won't you just take me home? I'm ready to be with you on streets of gold. I'm ready, ready to be with you where there's going to be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more crying. No more tears, Lord. I just want to be with you. He says, while we're in this house down here, we groan earnestly. He said, we desire to be clothed upon with that house, that one like Jesus had when he walked through the walls, but he was still able to eat. That glorified body that the word of God teaches that we will have. That word right there, house, what is it? What is it in the Greek? This is it right here. Oikaterion. Same exact word, only used two times in the, in, the, in the Greek New Testament. Two times. It means house. What is it talking about? It's talking about a body. So these angels left that original habitation, that original body, and somehow, somehow transmuted or shape-shifted and some weird stuff went on. All right, let's dig a little bit deeper. Y'all ready? All right, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. This is another passage of Scripture that talks about angels that sin. There's a lot of angels that sin, right? Whenever they, when they defied God, they followed after the fallen angel Lucifer is what they call him, Satan in the Bible. And, and, and according to a, a certain passage in the book of Revelation, we believe that a third of the angels fell with him. But it said right here in 2 Peter 2, 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved, to judgment. Can you go ahead and go to the next verse? I just want to make sure that, hey, look at this. Here's another reference to Noah. Okay, here's another 
another, uh, here's a reference to Noah. He says, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood upon the world of the ungodly. The reason I wanted you to see that is, is that it's connecting those angels and whatever they did, whatever the sin was that caused them to be reserved in chains of darkness. In the next verse, it's connecting it to the time frame of Noah, because we're about to go all the way back to Noah, because this is when this all first went back. All right. So go back to, to verse four. And I want you to see, I did a lot of studying on just the concept of hell a long, long time ago. I'm not going to get into all that right now because we don't have time. But you see that word hell right there? It says, for God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. I want you to know that that word hell right there is a little bit different. Well, you know, one of the, one of the ways that I, I taught on this, on this concept of hell was that it had, it was a, it was a place that contained, it was a place where the dead go, obviously. Uh, but in the Old Testament, there's a lot of different words. That, um, I don't have an eraser. I needed an eraser, but it's going to be too much of a mess to try to do all that. So let me just say this. There was, there's a hell. If you look at the Old Testament words and you look at the New Testament word, there's a lot of different compartments. Does that make sense? There's a place in the parable of Luke where he says it's called Abraham's bosom. We'll just put Abe right there. Abraham's bosom. That's where, the, that's where Lazarus went whenever he died. And then there was a place called torment. And that's where the rich man was. Right. And then there's a place right here, this word hell right here in the Greek, it's Tartarus. Now I'm going to try to explain this to you a little bit in a second, but this is very profound. This concept right and then underneath, the Bible says in the book of Revelation, that's supposed to be fire, not water. I'm not a very good argument. There's a place called Gehenna. That's the last death. And death and hell and Hades and all that stuff are going to go down into that and it's all going to be destroyed. I want, to, I want to focus on that word Tartarus right there for a moment. That's what the word for hell right there is in the Greek. Tartaru. Now you got to understand something. I'm not trying to get overly technical. But the, by the New Testament was written in a, Greek, in a language called Koine Greek. Koine Greek was already in existence whenever Jesus came to the earth. Does that make sense? It was already there. Alexander the Great conquered the known world. And, and through this concept that we learned in school called Hellenism, he, called, he spread Grecian influence throughout the whole world. The language that they spoke was Greek when Jesus showed up on the scene. We, got, we, we need to talk more about that some other day. God was preparing the world to receive Jesus. Everybody was speaking the same language. That word was already in existence in the Greek language. You know what that word, now there's multiple different words for hell, but you know what that word Tartarus means? In Greek mythology, it's the place. Where the immortals that sinned and crossed the boundaries ended up in this murky abyss that was reserved for them. This word was specifically used by the New Testament writer to describe a place where these fallen angels. So what I'm trying to, what are you trying to say, preacher? I'm trying to tell you that all that Greek mythology that says that Hercules was was a, a, I don't remember who his mom and his daddy were. Was it Zeus and Persephone? I'm just making up some names. I don't even know that that's, so don't hold me to it if you're watching the video. I'm just trying to make a point. It was a god and it was a mortal. So then, oh, here we go. So then now the naysayers, no, I didn't thought about all this. You can't, you're not going to trick me. But then the naysayers say, yes, but Grecian mythology existed before the New Testament Greek was written. Yeah, but the true story started off in the garden with God, and he spoke to Adam and Eve, and that the, the truth was spread through oral tradition throughout the people of God, and then each other people group, after this Tower of Babel, and they began to spread off, they took their little stories with them to all the little areas where they were, and their stories weren't true. Why? Because they were under the influence of fallen angels and demon spirits. And God, God's people were under the influence of the Archangel Michael and under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Or at least that's what they were supposed to be being led to speak forth the truth of God's word. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? I guess what I'm trying to say is this, is that Greek mythology is just an alternate story of the true story of the Bible of Genesis chapter 6. And there's all kinds of other stories out there. The Epic of Gilgamesh. It's, it's, in, it's written on a tablet of stone in a language that is the, 
is the first language ever known to man. And so people are like, it sounds almost exactly like this flood story of Noah. And so people automatically think, look at this. Look at these stupid Christians. They believe the Bible. And there's a, and there's a flood story almost exactly like the story of Noah in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And, it, and, and the language predates that. Yeah, but hold on a second, dude. That doesn't mean that that's just because that, that was just the first time it was written down. And it was written down by a people group after the Tower of Babel who, who were deceived into believing and to create a narrative to cause confusion. That's really what I'm trying to do tonight is to explain to you the level of deception out there of the enemy and how he's created this world. You know what it's like? You know, you know what I realize? Sometimes people don't sometimes people like to watch a movie. Man, I'm telling you, the director, the producer, the writer, they got together and they just produced this work. And I mean, you just sit down and from get, they got you, right? And you're just like, wow. And they tell a story and the characters, characters change. And there's just narrative and it's just like this beautiful story. And in two hours, they kept you on the edge of your seat. And then, but then to really, if you, man, I love that movie. I think I'm going to go watch the behind the scenes thing and try to learn a little bit about how they made that movie. But could you imagine like a script? That tells us, you know how many, most people wouldn't want to read that script. She, she crinkled her eyebrow as he yelled at her. Why did she crinkle her eyebrow? I mean, you know, that's, that's how my brain works. I want to know why you crinkled your eyebrow. And, and that's what I'm trying to say. When we dig into all of this, that's the point that I'm trying to make. Is that there's things that are going on upon this earth. But the fastest way to get to you, what I'm trying to say is. If you ever saw the movie The Matrix, that's what I'm trying to say. You've been, we've been living inside the matrix. And I don't know what color the pills were, but the right pill is the one that opened your eyes to Jesus. Not the way that they produced the story because there's, that's Hollywood and Hollywood still going to produce the story with a slant and an angle to keep you deceived. It's like the Truman Show. All your life, Jim Carrey grew up in this little neighborhood. He's got like a white pink fence. Do, 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 do. Life is good. The birds are singing. Everything's grand and glorious. And then all of a sudden, boom, he walks into a wall. He didn't even realize he grew up on a movie set all of these years. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah, I know it sounds crazy what I'm saying to you. But what I'm trying to tell you is, is that I believe that this world has been manipulated in such a way by the forces of evil and that they have infiltrated society in such a way that it that we sometimes even in the church yes, sir, we've right. been deceived and we cannot right. see what's really going on out there and when it's all said and done all i'm trying to get across to you is when it, when it, when, it, when this all this is done amen is that you understand we've got a formidable foe my friend and, and he's working deception and i call it deep dark magic and he's causing people to be Drunken by, by another spirit of another kind. And many times people, even, even people that mean well, pastors that stand behind pulpits, they have been infiltrated because the big system that we call the church is like there's this big move now with this seeker sensitive program that says, oh, don't tell them that. Don't tell them about sin because then they're not going to want to come back. What are you talking about? If you don't know that there's a problem called sin, you don't know that God sent an answer. He sent Jesus to die on the cross. You don't have to live that way anymore. Hallelujah. You can be set free. So what I'm supposed to do, not tell you? No, I'm here to tell you. Because the Lord set me free. Amen. So, anyway, Tartarus. That's what we want. Tartarus. The place that, that housed those immortals. So what I'm trying to tell you is Hercules is probably a Nephilim. Might have even been, he might have been probably, I thought he was probably real. But they just, they, they change everything. They change the story, throw you off the path, get your sniff off to where you lose your scent, you know, to cause all this confusion the way you don't find it. Because listen to me, folks. If you went to the Smithsonian Institute, I'm just saying, if you did, and you saw skeletons to giant human beings, what would you, you would be like, oh my God. Okay, so then the next step is, oh, well, wait, I, I think somebody told me I'm spoken about a giant. That, that there was giants in the Bible. See, and then what would you do? That would be physical evidence that would actually prove to you that the Bible was true. So all I'm trying to say is, I know, where's the physical evidence? I don't know. Is that something that possibly man? I'm not trying to say man destroyed it. I'm not trying to say they ever found it. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to make a point. With the way that the world is going and the control that people try to have over other people, do you think that the forces that be would want you to know that there's something true about the Bible? No. That's the only point I'm trying to make. Amen. 
All right. So let's go to Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, where all this started. This is pre-flood right here. So there, listen, there's a lot of things that happened pre-flood that we just don't know. The only reason we even know the story of pre-flood, because according to the Bible's testimony, the only people that made it out was eight people. And Noah was one of them, right? And eight people made it out, and then the world was repopulated. And that might be hard for you to swallow, but I'm here to tell you that natural mind cannot perceive the things of God. I believe it. It says, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God. Now, I want you to know that word there in the Greek is, I'm sorry, Hebrew is ben Elohim, sons of God, ben Elohim. So we're going to look at some other spots in the Old Testament where that terminology is utilized, and we're going to try to determine what we're dealing with here. Who are these sons of God? Because, look, when I went to seminary, what they tried to teach me over there was that, this, that the sons of God were the descendants of Cain. And so they were saying that the descendants of Cain slept with the daughters of Seth. And, it produced, and so then my next question is, okay, well, why in, why in the world did that produce giants? Come on, man. Yeah. What y'all trying to, y'all just trying to lead me down the road. Something's not right. Just my logical mind won't let me go there, right? All right. So he says that multiply on the face of the earth, the daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. All right, now, Let's just, let's just slow down for a second. I want to just kind of try to give you some imagery because I, really, I can't really do it for you. If my iPad was working, I would quickly Google Persian King in the movie 300. Did anybody watch 300? Yeah. All right. I watched it one time when it was on regular TV. <laughs> and anyway, I was watching the movie, and there was a Persian king that came out to meet these 300 warriors. What was it? Big old tall. Slanky, long-fingered nails looked exactly like Satan himself. What I'm trying to tell you is that's not an accidental depiction. I believe with all of my heart. And listen, these people are studying. Hollywood people are studying. When we get in, we're about to get into this next week, where it's going to name some of the offspring. You know who some of the offspring? One of the big giants that produced a bunch of children in the Bible were the sons of Anak. Does that word Anak remind you of something? <coughs> Anakin. George Lucas was all up in this stuff whenever he wrote Star Wars. What I'm trying to say is, is that why are they working so hard to try to learn all these stories to try to read, bring all of this stuff? Because it's, it has to do with gods. It has to do with, with these false gods that have been in the land. All right. What I want you to know, too, is, is that, listen, there's extra biblical evidence. There's a book called the Book of Enoch. It's not part of our biblical canon. I don't think it should be. But it was quoted by Jude. It was quoted by Jude. So anytime that a biblical author quotes another book, it has some credence to it. The book of Enoch goes into even more detail about these angels. It calls them watcher angels. And it says that about 200 of them descended upon Mount Hermon. And I'm just trying to tell you some of the backstory according to the book of Enoch. Now, again, I'm not trying to tell you that this is definite because it's not scripture. But there is some validity and it seems to make some sense. They described that some of these watcher angels actually had tattoos of spells and incantations all over them and that they walked around and that they influenced the women and that there was a bartering that was going on that they would teach them deep magical secrets that actually was able to, to change physical objects. I mean, we're talking like magic at a level that I guess you and I have never really seen. Again, how much of this is true, I can't prove it, but it all it all kind of makes some sense in that that's the backstory behind it, that they were teaching mankind how to engage in these magical practices, these occult practices, and that it was it was seducing to these women. And you know, I can remember one time when I was first telling Sierra about all of this stuff, and she was my daughter, and she was like, Daddy, why? And we're about to get into it, but why would God allow that to happen? And you know, one of the things that I've realized as I studied the occult is that God gave you and I free will. God gave you and I free will. And you know what his desire is? His desire is that you and I will take the free will that he gave us and that we will give it back to him as a gift. That we will willingly give our life back to him. 
Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but he liveth in me. And now this life I live in, in, in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He died so that I could live. Now he wants me to die in him so that he can live through me. What do you mean? He wants you to die, Matt. He wants you to go, no, no, no. I'm not talking about physical death. He wants Matt's fleshly desires. He wants the things... Matt's desires that are contrary to the will of God to die at the cross so that he can now begin to live through me. Because if I'm still going after what I want to go after and it's contrary to the word of God, there's not a testimony for God in the midst of all of that. So what I told Sierra was the only thing I can figure, sweetie, is that just as God gave, the, God gave those human beings free wills, and I've learned a lot more since then, and I believe it. They, they chose to take those free wills and to be used as vessels for the kingdom above. And listen to me, people still do that today. In which an indoor day, all kinds of other people willingly take their free will. Right. And instead of giving it to God, to be used as a vessel for God, they're used as a vessel for evil. Sometimes it's even preachers behind pulpits. Some of them preachers out there on TV, I'm going to tell you right now, and I'll say it. They know what they're doing. Yep. Oh, they know what they're doing. They're working for the man, the wrong man. And, and I'm here to tell you right now, it's, it, it, because listen, it's all a bunch of false doctrine. It's all a bunch of lies. It's all a bunch of manifestations of a bunch of lies. It's not the truth of the word of God. And if anybody would have cracked open the book to try to read it, they would have realized that there was a spirit of deception behind it. But that's another story for another time. But at the same time, we are talking about deception. Now, I will tell you one thing right now, that little... <laughs> word uh, can you go back to Genesis chapter 6 and just go look at verse uh, 4 I will tell you this now this doesn't mean this isn't how we create our biblical doctrine but I just want you to see this see where it says they bear children at the bottom of the of verse 4 they bear children to them the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown you see that phrase there men of old men of renown one of the things that i found as i was studying all that crazy occultic stuff about alistair crowley was he made a comment in one of his writings the fastest way to get a hold of the old ones now you do what you want with that. I'm just telling you what the fastest way to get a hold of the old ones and it's kind of weird to get into it any deeper maybe another day i'll say it but i'm gonna like saying it right now and it had to do with a sacrifice, like a human, a perverted human sacrifice. That was the fastest way to get a hold of these, to get them in your service, to utilize their power, to, to, to try to. Do, why, does it, why are you getting into all this? Because listen, when we get to Revelation 17 and we see this harlot that's right in the back of his beast, we realize that this same spirit has been influencing the entire earth from the beginning of the garden. And it's working its way all the way through. We need to understand what's going on here. Because it's in the word of God. Now let's look at Job chapter 1 verse 6. I'm going to give you a few more scriptures. We're getting close to, to, to close. And I know that, that this is a lot of information. I appreciate you bearing with me. That's so high. Yes, sir. It's five saw the giants. It's five? five saw the giants. Yes, it's five saw the giants. That's a good point. And we'll get into that probably next week. Because I was going to show you different areas where they were. And what he's talking about is after the exodus. When they were wandering in the wilderness. God told Joshua to take the men and to go into the land that he was promised them. And what did they say? They saw the giants in the land. And they said, we were like last. Now, the scripture that we just read, we don't have to go back to it. We can stay where we are right now. I'm just going to tell you. It says that it happened before the flood and it happened after the flood. So some people have asked the question, how, if God put all those angels in this murky abyss for transgressing at the point, why didn't he put the rest of them? <coughs> or why didn't them other angels later realize what happened to their angelic brethren and not want to do that? Well, have you ever been ate up with sin before? Yeah. I know I have. And when you're ate up with sin and you and and you know that God doesn't want you to do something, but at the same time, the power of sin is more powerful in your life at that moment in time, you can't control it. Right. You understand? What I mean? You think that a fallen angel can control? Even though he knows that his friend, I'm just saying it that way. His friend is in these chains of darkness because he, did you think that he can control himself? No, that's number one. But number two, some people have speculated that Ham's wife, there's no proof to this, 
But that ham's wife could have actually already been carrying that genetic stuff on the inside. In other words, she could have been already impregnated and brought it over to the other side. Can't prove it, but it is a thought that one of those women may have, and we just say ham because there was a curse spoken over, over Ham's son Canaan. Um, but nevertheless, we can't prove that, but those are the two concepts on how they ended up on the other side of the flood. All right? So let's look at Job chapter 1, verse 6. And then we'll go to Job chapter 2, verse 1. Job 1, 6, it says, There was a day when the sons of God, God same words, Ben Elohim, sons of God. It's talking about angels, but look what kind of angels it is. It says, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also with them. So what we see here is the same terminology being used as fallen angels with Satan. You don't think that Cain's lineage could just... Right. I mean, I'm being facetious, but do you think that Cain's offspring, because they were the fallen ones that supposedly slept with Seth's daughters and produced giants in the land, what do you think they grabbed a hold of Satan's back and rode up there with him to present themselves? I know I'm being facetious, but that's the point that they tried to te teach me in Bible college, that, that those sons of God were Cain's offspring. So how in the world did them sons of God, the same word, get up there if they're human beings? They're not human beings, they're fallen angels. Did that make sense what I said? Yeah. Grab, try to grab a ride from Satan as he flaps his wings up to heaven. So the point being is that these are fallen angels with Satan. Look at Job 2.1. It's the same thing. There again was a day. The sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Look at John, Job 38.7. He's talking to Job now later on. See the enemy in the first two verses we read. Those fallen angels and Satan were wanting to tempt tempt Job and they were asking God to remove his hand of protection from him because they were saying that Job would defy God. Now in the now this is towards the end and God is having a conversation with Job and he's saying where were you Job? Where were you when I created the earth? And this is one of the things he says where were you when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Talking about hey, now these are good angels. Shouting for joy. So the, the word Ben Elohim is used for angels but you got to look at the context to describe what we're talking about. Whenever they co whenever they crossed boundaries and they slept with women, they weren't supposed to do that. That's bad angels. Whenever they were trying to tempt Job and they were with Satan, that's bad angels. All right? Why would they do such a thing? Look at Genesis 3.15. So look, this is before the flood. This is before the flood. This is right here in the garden after the fall. Look what God tells, tells the serpent. This is what God tells the devil. He says... And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his head. You bruise his heel and you shall bruise his head. I'm sorry. He shall bruise your head, which means crush it. And that's whenever you crush a snake's head, what happens? He, he doesn't have his power. And you shall bruise his heel. That's talking about Jesus going to the cross. All right. Now, what I want you to see is, is that what does mankind this first word that was spoken, this is pre-flood. What does the enemy know about the plan of redemption right here? That the plan of redemption is going to come through the seed of the woman. Does that make sense? What I'm trying to say? This is the first. Scholars call this the, the proto-evangelium. Proto means first. Evangelium means gospel. The first proclamation of the gospel. Scholars call this the first proclamation of the gospel. God proclaimed the truth to the serpent in the garden. He said the seed of the woman is going to crush your head. He was looking forward to the day that Jesus would ultimately come through the nation of Israel and would bring deliverance to the human race. So that's, so what I'm trying to tell you is, is that this enemy, this deceiver, he knows this now. All right. And so I wish that I had, could show you the pictures of all the mother child deities all over the world. That's evidence to me. I'm sorry, my friend. Pre-flood, they all know the same story. God confuses their languages. People groups begin to spread across the globe under the influence of fallen angels. We're going to get into that later on when we get into the book of Daniel. The prince of Persia, a fallen angel over the Persian Empire. The prince of Grecia, a fallen angel over the Grecian Empire. Theoretically, we have principalities and powers, according to the word of God, over nation groups. And they're giving these lies to people that are contrary to the word of God. And listen, 
All over the globe, you can see mother-child deities. I mean, it was all over the Roman Empire. It was all over the Grecian Empire, the Canaanite religion. It was in South America, even in China. The Jesuits, when they showed up in China, they saw that there was a mother-child deity over there, and they were blown away. They're like, what in the world? Because they were the ones that were spreading all the news. They could understand it after they go to a, a country where, where the word might have been heard and people later on had heard about the, the Madonna, which is not the, true, the, is not the true mother of Jesus right there. But we'll get, that, we don't have time to get into all that. That's another remake. I got a, a message that I preached a long time ago called Smoke and Mirrors. And if you want to go watch that, it'll explain to you all these mother-child deities, how it all started off, one big lie from the enemy. He knew this from the garden, and then once the flood takes place, uh, once the, the confusion of the languages takes place after the flood and the people group spread, they all got their version of the story, and here we see it popping all back up again. Just like we see all these pyramids all over the world, pyramids and ziggurats popping up all over the world. Where did all this come from? Well, you know what? Do, do your homework, my friend. I, look, I'm giving out these books. I mean, you talk about a fast read, yeah. and it's a fast, easy read, and it's like chock full of at least what I feel like the Lord showed me. You might not agree with me in the end, but there it is. I'm giving them away for free. If you haven't read one yet, read that, watch that five-hour video, and your brain might be ready to receive what we're trying to say is really going on here. Because we're trying to prepare the hearts of people. We're trying to prepare the hearts of people and the minds of people for whatever comes next. Because you can say whatever you want about this whole thing, the state of this globe that we're in right now. I'm not getting too crazy with all this. But I'm telling you right now, for the way that this world changed in one day, it seemed like, yes. the whole world. Yeah. So, something just ain't right, my friend. Again, let's, let's just keep going. We're about to stop. Why would they do such a thing? Why would these fallen angels do such a thing? To try to bring an infection, a poison, to try... To mess up the genetics of the woman so that the seed of the woman would be infiltrated, would be destroyed so that the plan of God could be destroyed. Yeah. One of the things that you learn about Noah, when it says he was perfect in all his generations, when you look at it in the Hebrew, the concept behind there is that he, his bloodline was pure. He didn't have this stuff in him. God saved him. He's the one that God chose to use to bring bring mankind into the new world if that makes sense all right why would god allow that god gave man a free will and if man chooses he can use that free will to turn himself over to be used as a vessel for evil can can this can the musicians come forward because we're going to go ahead and we're going to start yes ma'am so because okay so noah had his family with him so they were pure as well well, we don't know for that. We don't. We're not told that. We're just the only thing we're told is about no. I mean, the theory would be yes. Well, all I'm trying to say is, is that I've heard people. That's a good question. I've heard people try to have speculated that is it possible that one of those daughter-in-laws that got on the boat could have already been impregnated and carried it over that way. We don't know that. We can't prove that. To me, it's just as likely that the whole thing started all over again after the flood. Okay, so, um, but but the word of God says Noah was that. So he didn't defile himself with. Yes, Noah, Noah you mean? Right. Yes. Okay. Well, it wasn't in his bloodline. Okay. Um, so why would God allow that? God gave man a free will, and if man chooses, he could use that free will to turn himself over to be used as a vessel for evil. Again, ultimately, I wanted to point out that these these things, these nephilim, ended up being demon spirits whenever they become disembodied from that body now they're demon spirits some demon spirits are in the abyss some demon spirits are on the earth and they're tormenting people they're tormenting sometimes you, some of you in this room have been tormented and oppressed by demon spirits they have lied to you they have whispered to you some of the darkest places in my life demon spirits have tried to convince me that the best thing that i could do was just to end it, just to stop and that, that, that it was you know that there was no hope i'm here to tell you that they lied to individuals but right. they're also yeah. lying to the world at large yes and i'm here to tell you that jesus died so that you could be free. Yeah. you could be free i'm not telling you you're never gonna have another bad day that's not what i'm saying but what i'm saying is, is that the lord wants to protect you amen. he wants to protect you amen. amen as they sing this song i just want to encourage you listen as we sing about jesus 
If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to know these altars are always open. I'm more than happy to pray with anybody. But you know what? Right there where you are, right there where you are, you can call on the name of Jesus. You can invite him into your heart. You can say, Lord, I want you. Lord, I don't even understand it all, but I'm asking you to save my soul. And I'm telling you, if you mean business with God, he will come into your heart. He will come into your life. It doesn't mean the devil's going to quit. He ain't going to quit. He's going to try. But you know what? God, he that is in you, once you get saved and the Holy Spirit lives in you, the word of God says, he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. The Spirit of God is greater than the spirit of disobedience that's driving those children, the children of the world in the wrong way. They're going to sing us a song.